promotional consideration paid for by the following. Hello, beautiful people. It's time for another retro review. And this time, we're in jolly old England for Insurrection, coming to you on the 7th of June, 2003, from the Newcastle uh, Telewest Arena in front of 10,000 people. Obviously, it is a small arena, smaller than the ones you find in the USA for uh, ice hockey, I believe. Uh, although I think they've got a new, they've got a basketball team as well, so it could be both, it could be either, it could be one or, or the other. So, <clears throat> yeah, the Telewest Arena. I'm not quite sure what it'd be called now. Uh, probably won't be called the Telewest Arena anymore. But it's uh, like I say, it's a sellout. It is a Raw only pay per view featuring Kevin Nash versus Triple H in the main event. Smackdown would have their own sort of tourish type thing as well, but this for now is a Raw only event featuring the superstars of Raw and it features also on the game Smackdown Here Comes the Pain for the PS2. Very good game. Been playing that recently on the gaming channel Cheap Shot Entertainment System, so go and check that out. Meanwhile, we hope you enjoy this review and that if you're listening on the podcasting software podcasts on Spotify, then other podcasting software is available. I just find this one really easy because I had the previous one before it came podcasts on Spotify. So, uh, yeah, it, it works. Anyway, um, we're going to give you our thoughts, or I'm going to give you my thoughts. I don't know why we always say we, I'm just like everyone. Uh, if you've watched this show recently, or even if you were there, please do comment and let us know what you thought. Because I've been to quite a few live events. I'm not going to any big live events this year, but as well documented on this channel, I do now frequent wrestling events, either as a fan or as a referee or a manager or even a ring announcer now. Uh, training to be an in-ring competitor as well, so maybe soon you'll even see me wrestling on a show near you. But for the time being, let's see what the guys and gals of WWE in 2003 have to offer. So, we get an opening package saying that insurrection is upon us and change is in the air. So, why not start with a title match because there's every chance that change will happen straight away at insurrection on the 9th of June. <clears throat> well, it is for the Women's Championship. And it is the current reigning and defending champion, Jazz, defending against the former champion, the lady who she beat at WrestleMania in Trish Stratus. Now, this feud has been going on for quite a while. It's actually got a really good storyline to it. There's definite hatred between the two. You can feel that there's there's good chemistry as well in that respect as well and uh, you know I will always say this I'm the biggest fan of Trish Stratus just because of where she came from to where she went and how good she became by working hard and doing what she needed to do now I don't know whether it's just an American thing but they actually give this match some time they give it at least 10 minutes, which is a good amount of time for a wrestling match, especially a women's wrestling match back in 2003. You can really tell that Jazz has come from a different background here to Trish, but they work so well. And of course, Jazz is accompanied by Theodore Long. But what a match. It continues from where... 
Judgment Day left off, and it actually is a very good match. Lots of backing and forthing. There's no punches pulled here because they go at each other, and they go at each other well. Uh, multiple submission mat uh, submissions applied. Boston Crabs, STFs, and it is Trish who has Jazz in her own move, the STF. And Jazz is about to tap out when Victoria comes down to the ring and distracts the referee. And whilst that is all happening, Theodore Long comes in and throws Trish Stratus shoulder first into the post. That would lead to the finish. Bit of a screwy finish, but hey, there was only one little bit of interjection from the manager or from an outside source. So I can happily live with that because when there's too much it takes away from the match in this match there wasn't it was the right amount once and done and it did the job jazz comes away still wwe women's champion with the help of theodore long of course and <clears throat> like i said it's a good match it's a good opener people are well up for this and I'm going to give this one three cheap shots out of five because it shows where the women are going from this point. It would tail off and they'd become the Divas division instead, going towards the latter end of the 2000s. But it's starting to turn a corner again, which is good. And we move on to the next match. So, there's no backstage segments in between these two matches, and we go straight into the second match. It is another title match for the Intercontinental Championship. It is Christian, the new reigning and defending Intercontinental Champion as of Judgment Day, having won in circumstances that are not really befitting of the Intercontinental Championship. At Judgment Day in the Over the Top Battle Royal, Over the Top Rope Battle Royal, it would be Booker T, who his his opponent was, and quite rightly so, as it was Booker T who he cheated out of the championship in the first place. So we go into this match with a little bit of backstory to it, and Booker T is on fire with this. Christian playing the typical cowardly heel here and he plays it very very well in front of his euro peeps as king refers to them uh like i say book t on absolute fire christian would get a few licks in here and there but it would be mainly christian uh sorry mainly book t who would be the aggressor in this one including a second rope dive from Christian to a scissor kick uh, from Book T, which was absolutely awesome and timed really, really well. I don't feel like this match is as good as the first one just because of the pomp and circumstance of the first one. The women actually given time to actually work and show what they can do. Book T and Christian are consummate professionals all the way through their careers. And whenever asked to do something, they will do it. And, and that is good. Of course, Booker T would get his shots down the line and titles coming up and uh, his legendary status within the WWE and WCW. But it would be Christian who would pick up the win. Booker T well on top here, elbowing the referee by accident. Uh, luckily, the referee wasn't knocked out or anything. Because Booker T would go for the roll-up, the uh, reverse victory roll sort of roll-up. Um, Christian would reverse this and then grab the top, well, grab the middle rope to get some leverage. The referee would not see this and Christian would come away with the championship. Still, champion. Uh, all the way through. JR is saying that's not befitting of an intercontinental champion and I'm inclined to agree. But 
Christian is still your champion and his peeps go home very happy. I do like Christian as a heel. I don't like that they slowed down his music though. I think that does need a little bit of pep to it. I know why they've done it, because he's a heel, but it didn't need slowing down. It was heelish as it was. So, um, yeah, that's that's my only gripe with this one. Um, but I'm going to score it the same as the last one um, at three cheap shots out of five. Moving on. To the next match, we see Stone Cold walking down the corridor as Theodore Long comes out of the women's dressing room telling Jazz to get changed, baby girl. Only for Stone Cold to question him about his antics during the women's championship match. Blatantly calling him a cheater, he then makes a six-man tag match with the Dudley Boys, Devon and Bubba Ray along with Spike Dudley, against Rodney Mack, Christopher Nowinski, and none other than Teddy Long himself. He says, I'm not a wrestler. Stone Cold says, I bet that suit cost nineteen ninety five in a thrift store. I love Stone Cold, he's brilliant. Uh, tells Theodore Long to turn tail and get ready for his match, just as Kane turns up behind Stone Cold Steve Austin and then we get some context to this because Stone Cold gave Kane a chat on Raw and ended up stunnering one half of the Raw Tag Team Champions or although they were called the World Tag Team Champions at the time and again beautiful titles that were different from the Smackdown titles and not just a red version of the same titles I think it's about time we had some new tag team titles in 2023, to be honest with you. But we then see the next match, which happens to be for another championship. And the championship matches are coming thick and fast in this one. thought they might have spaced them out a little bit, but three tag, three championship matches in the first three matches. And uh, we get uh, Kane, I was going to say Booker T. Booker T's already been in the last match. Kane and RVD, the current World Tag Team Champions, going against La Resistance, that's Silhan Ronnier and René Dupree, which, incidentally, I managed to, <laughs> I found a T-shirt that I got from René Dupree. Um, yeah. Well before the pandemic, actually, probably about 2018. It might have even been 2019, so it might not have been well before. But yeah, we saw him on a on an independent show here in the UK. Like I said in the last video, he's, he's based in Burton, I think. So he's not too far away from where I am. So, <clears throat> yeah, La Resistance come down, cut promo saying how much France is better than... Britain and that Britons aren't are not too far away from Americans and well I mean that's true obviously because we pretty much populated America but um, through uh, ill-gotten means of course but either way it's a standard heel promo and it doesn't go over well with the British people so we move on to the next match it is Kane and RVD, as I've already mentioned, going against Sylvain Renier and René Dupree. And it's a pretty standard tag team match. It's decent in a sense that both teams are very good. La Resistance coming in uh, quite, quite new. King alludes to the fact that they have been undefeated in WWE, but... They've only been in the company for a, a month, maybe two. So it's nothing to really write home about as far as that goes. And uh, Kane and RVD are tag team champions. They are the classic mismatch duo that seem to do well. So what do we get from this match? Lots of four people in the ring all at once. And it makes the referee look like a bit of a tool, to be honest. However... It's still entertaining enough 
to be good. Uh, I mean, just as you think that RVD and Kane are getting the upper hand, La Resistance come back. And it is uh, RVD getting thrown over the top, crotching himself on the top rope and ending up on the outside. Uh, where Kane then does a he manages to hit a double choke slam on La Resistance. And uh, yeah, that leads to a pin. So um, so RVD rolls back in. Miraculous recovery there from the froggy one and hits the frog splash. Five star frog splash, might add, for the win. And your tag team champions still are RVD and Kane. And lo and behold, Kane hits his pyro after the match and there is a theory here that if Kane hits his pyro before the match he's not going to win but if he hits it afterwards and you know his music's playing obviously he's already won so this match again three cheap shots out of five does what it needs to do and is pretty damn good we move on So moving on now to the next match. <clears throat> it is Rico versus Gold Dust. And uh, yeah, it's it's alright actually this one. I was quite I was quite impressed by it to be fair. Uh Rico obviously coming in as a manager and doing his bit. Wasn't anything like spectacular or anything, but he did what he needed to do and you know with me being on the same path i quite like that it it gives me a bit of hope shall we say anyway um like i say gold dust is consummate professional uh, always has been always will be and he is you know calling the match really well and in delivers on the goods for this one because Rico gets a lot of his heat in there's huge long lengths of heat here where Rico is on top of Gold Dust Gold Dust tries to come back with his little bits and bobs with the butt thump and stuff like that um, but sadly the crowd is not responding to this I guess it's just the fact that they don't really know Rico obviously everyone knows Gold Dust Gold Dust Probably had his best run around this time, really. And, uh, yeah, it would be Gold Dust picking up the win after Rico misses a... I'm trying to think what it's called. Now, a moonsault. Sorry, I'm doing this quite early in the morning. He misses a moonsault. Uh, Gold Dust sets him up in the corner for... Uh, I think, did they call it the Golden Globes? now um but basically it was the setup for the shattered dreams as it was back in the day and uh, the referee jumps in between very strange never done that before but that gives rico a chance to come back um before gold dust hits a power slam out of nowhere before randy orton was even a twinkle they did the out of nowhere thing with gold dust and he picks up the victory um like i say decent match i think we're we're on a level here we we know what we're getting even though it was live it's a standard house show that they bring over to the uk every year uh with a bit of set dressing um, once again, I'm going to give this three cheap shots out of five. It was it was very entertaining. It wasn't bad at all. We've not had a terrible match yet, but we've still got Triple H to come. But that is a street fight, so it might just give that little bit of onus to put something together that makes it entertaining, eh? But we'll move on to the next part, which is a touching tribute to uh, then recently deceased classy Freddie Blassie when lots of superstars giving their uh, tributes to the the first real champion 
uh, classy Freddy Blassie, uh, a man that preceded everything. He was a fantastic manager, and that that phrase, you pencil neck geek, was very much reminiscent of the time, uh, being, uh, you know, a Almost like sports coach, I suppose. Um, but yeah, he was he was great, and um, he was one of the first ever managers to be known before managers were like fully seen as part of the scenery and part of the action. Classy Freddie Blassie brought that to the forefront, and then it laid the foundation for others to come as well and we often forget about classy Freddie Blassie as one of the great managers but he definitely was and uh, yeah it's now been 20 years since he passed so sad times but life moves on and uh, the pay-per-view does as well So, just as I was saying that there's been no promos, we get the highlight reel from Chris Jericho. He comes down to the ring, berates the fans in Newcastle, the fact that he has been provided with a shoddy set and calling them all, what do they call them? Uh, I can't even remember now. It was that memorable. Although, this, this segment is actually pretty good. It is pretty darn good. Jericho is interviewing... Eric Bischoff. Um, so he comes down to the ring. He, they both dig into the uh, the Newcastle fans. Uh, oh, that's what he calls them. He calls them tossers. Um, <laughs> which I thought was absolutely brilliant. I love Jericho. He's he's great, um, especially around this time. He was a good heel. And um, <clears throat> Stone Cold's music hits. He says. He's had a great time since being in Newcastle. He's drank one pint, two pint, three pint, what? Up to 20 pints. The man must be an absolute machine. Then again, he always drinks Miller Lite. So, you know, um, lager, not for me anymore. I had my time. It was around about this time when I was at university, actually, in 2004, rather than 2003, but you get the point. Anyway, <clears throat> this segment carries on. And uh, Stone Cold offers them both a beer. What Chris Jericho does here is get the whole crowd to say, do what did he do, did he do? Uh, after, you know, reeling off the great bands and musicians that have come out of the UK. None of them are from Newcastle, incidentally, but, you know, <clears throat> one of those things, isn't it? <clears throat> and, uh, yeah, he gets them to say, do what did he do, did he do? And Stone Cold even is cracking his smile here. And he says, never thought I'd see that. You've turned yourself a beer. And lo and behold, they drink the beer. And stunners all round for Chris Jericho. At the very least, anyway. After he said that he'd changed some matches. Enjoyable segment, actually. Really good. Really needed to break up everything that was going off. On a very... Uh, a good pay-per-view, but nothing spectacular at this point. So, so we move on to the next match. It is a tag team tables match. Six man featuring the Dudley Boys. That's Bubba Ray, Devon and Spike versus the team of Rodney Mack and Christopher Nowinski, the Harvard graduate, along with their manager, Theodore Long. A match that was made earlier on in the night by Stone Cold Steve Austin and would have formed the the reason that Stone Cold came out in the highlight reel. Chris, uh, Chris Jericho. Uh, Christopher Nowinski is, well, Theodore Long says that Christopher Nowinski and Rodney Mack will tag well together because they are both in the minority. One being an obvious minority, because that was his stick at the time, and the other one being a Harvard graduate, being so smart that he is a minority. And, uh, yeah, they work pretty well together. Teddy Long, man after my own heart, directing traffic on the outside, doing everything he can to distract the referee whilst the uh, whilst 
the other two feet up spike you know obvious take out the weak link so to speak the smallest of the bunch it doesn't last very long it's like i say incidentally it is a a tables match as far as i understand and uh, it's a novelty in the fact that there's tags in and out of the ring so uh, for every person that's in the ring they have to tag out usually in a tables match it's a free-for-all it's, it's tornado rules so this one is different for that fact and it's probably because Th Theodore Long is in it um, but it doesn't take long before the Dudley boys come back do all their kind of stuff the fans are eating the Dudley boys up at every single turn which is great and it would be Christopher Lewinsky who would get the pleasure of going through the table and eating the pin. So there you go. That is that match. It was fun and it was nice interjection, middle of the show, uh, to move on with the rest of it. And we go into um, another couple of matches after this. But I'm going to give this, again, a very reasonable three cheap shots out of five because slightly better than average uh it's a tables match i love stipulation matches when they're done right so i like this one <clears throat> so next up we get the match between test and big papa pump scott steiner with the managerial services of stacy keebler at the heart of this feud <clears throat> Stacy is contractually obligated to be Test's manager. Don't know how that works. And this is going to lead to a feud with Scott Steiner. Both are in the company. Both are very capable, but not being used well. Steiner has come in, had a couple of heavyweight championship matches, not impressed anybody. So he's been bumped down. Initially forming a tag team with Test at the hands of Stacey Keebler, only for them to fall out, of course, and go into this match with Stacey Keebler on the line. 2003, people. Anyway, it's a fairly standard match, this. It's better than Scott Steiner's other matches because it's a bit more simple and not high. I mean, it is pretty high on the card still. It's uh, second from the end. So, <clears throat> Test is all the time is bullying Stacy. Uh, Stacy is very much in the corner of Big Pop Pump. Big Pop Pump keeps it simple, throws some Steiner lines, hits a Steiner recliner, uh, eventually picking up the win with the flat liner. And uh, yeah, this is all down to uh, Stacy uh, stopping. Uh, test hitting Scott Steiner with a chair. Uh, she falls down, actually. She falls down off the apron uh, after uh, Scott Steiner almost takes her out and then Test pushes Scott Steiner into Stacy. Stacy sells the ankle for about two seconds, then climbs upon the apron and takes the chair, this leading to uh, Test being distracted into the flat liner and Scott Steiner picks up the win and the managerial services of Stacy Keebler. Again, not great. Not terrible, but not great. So I'm going to go and give this one two cheap shots out of five. I think that's very well deserved in this case. And uh, we're going to move on to the main event. There's nothing in between this show, this match and the main event apart from a highlights package showing Kevin Nash on his return, everything that's happened in between. And this leads to this match here at Insurrection in Newcastle. During the show, of course, we have seen Stone Cold um, come out, break up the uh, highlight reel and make the heavyweight championship match a street fight. And uh, we'd have Ric Flair in the corner of Triple H with Shawn Michaels being in the corner of Nash. And all four guys, unsurprisedly, would get involved. And uh, did I say unsurprisedly? Unsurprisingly, I'm going to um, 
correct myself on that one. And uh, unsurprisingly, it was all four guys involved in this one in some way, shape or form. But actually, it is a pretty entertaining match. You can't really go wrong with a street fight. You know, you get all the excitement of the match spilling out to the outside. They battle up to the top. Uh, Kevin Nash almost puts Triple H through the announce desk. Um, lots of people getting busted open here as well, of course. Ric Flair bleeding like a stuck pig uh, onto his very white slash blonde hair, which always, always shows up. And... Yeah, Shawn Michaels busted open as well, of course. This was when it, you know, using the busted open thing was not so prevalent in wrestling, which I do like, incidentally. Anyway, it would be uh, Triple H who would get the win. Because he can indeed use Sledgy and bring the sledgehammer into the ring. He did, wrapped it round Kevin Nash's head. And picks up the victory. I'm going to give this one three and a half cheap shots out of five. It's difficult to get a street fight absolutely spot on perfect. However, this one did a really good job of that. So, yeah, it involved everything. I say it's a street fight. I don't know why they really needed to announce the people out at ringside. But I suppose it fuels the fire, doesn't it? And, uh, yeah, it was a good end to a mediocre show. It, the whole show reeks of it's a house show, but because people are paying for it to watch it at home, we're going to have to put something on big. And that's where the street fight came in, I feel. But it's a better match for Triple H than it has been. We've peaked at WrestleMania 19, and even Triple H's match at WrestleMania 19 wasn't very good. Uh, ever since he's had that championship handed to him, he's not been great. 2003 was not a good year for Triple H in, in terms of good matches. However, this pay-per-view, it's okay. Would I recommend you go back and watch it? No, it's not anything to write home about. Um, but yeah, that is Insurrection comes to you live or came to you live from Newcastle and was on June 7th 2003 exactly 20 years ago today so if you enjoyed this retro review from Cheap Shot Entertainment please do consider subscribing to the YouTube channel or join us on our podcasting channel and uh, yeah we hope that we will see you there in future I've been your host, Luke. You've been the Cheap Shot Nation. Thank you very much for watching and or listening. And I will see you next time, wrestling fans. Goodbye. Hiya.